All right, everyone. It's known that voters are more reluctant to switch parties during wartime. And so I think I know why this particular statement, link in the description, archived, of course, uh, was being made. Biden and Blinken and others coming out and effectively saying there are red lines that you can't cross in the current conflict between Israel uh, slash certain other groups in the region and Hamas, Hezbollah, others. Um, you could see Syria get involved, etc. The basic premise is don't attack any U.S. assets or we're going to dogpile you. We're going to join the fray. I think that when you move numerous assets into a war zone, the tendency is that your assets inevitably take attrition. And of course, you're dealing with multiple non-state actors in the region, at least three that are hostile. Uh, and you could see, again, others joining in as well. Uh, Israel is striking in Lebanon. Not just, it's not just Gaza that's being hit right now. There's also crossfire going on to the north because of Hezbollah's involvement. Iran has rattled its sabers, although it seems more vacuous than normal. Like, less serious than the normal statements when something like this happens, actually. And maybe they're more interested in attempting some sort of long-term arrangement with the Saudis or something like that. Also, U.S. forces operating off Yemen. Uh, of course, the other day, uh, U.S. ships fired upon missiles that were being fired from Yemen. Again, I'm, I'm wondering whether those were aimed at Israel. Um, I don't think that rockets that can go that far are very common among the Houthi rebels. So I have a feeling that it was more of an action on behalf of the Saudis to try to keep them off to the side and, and appease them more than anything else. But Biden, make no mistake, wants a war. And when I say that, I mean he is desiring that the United States gets drawn into the current conflict going on in the Middle East. That's because it will have an impact on voting. All of a sudden, the U.S. is at war, flashes across all sectors, front page, legacy media coverage, etc., etc. Well, what are you not talking about then? The lackluster economy. The U.S. border, although unfortunately for Joe Biden, that particular issue has been, even by certain intel communities, effectively coalesced with what's going on there, a la Hamas. Well, you know, we're probably, we've got sleeper agents in the United States because you're only checking a proportion of the people that come across the border. We're finding now, by the way, Venezuelan migrants now more common than uh, Mexican ones at the southern border. Hey, at least they're uh, potentially fleeing communism, sort of Cuba style, so I don't know. Some of them might actually be repentant to following a left-wing economic system, so... I think they're in a slightly different category than people doing it for sheer opportunism. Because Venezuela doesn't really have an economy. Anyway, you do have, you have a porous border, uh, and that issue gets shoved aside again, except when it gets uh, overlapped with the issue that would be at hand, which is, hey, we're bombing people. Hey, they're bombing us, and look at all of the, the pretty explosions and stuff. Legacy media is McLovin' it, because they're the only ones that are allowed to post all that unedited footage of dead babies and stuff like that without getting banned on the internet so it gives them an advantage in the news cycle trust me some of these people are jovial in private about the fact that there's mass killing happening right now on both sides of the border there there's one problem though and this is something that i thought of almost as soon as i got up i was prepping for this video i had uh, tagged it up yesterday because i wanted to explain if you look at these statements again take that link in the description and tell me that that's not effectively a, an antagonistic, hey, we can poke you, you better not poke back because then we'll slap the shit out of you. That's the only way that I can really interpret the statements being made there by the U.S. State Department. There's a problem, though, and that's that Donald Trump is a former president, and he's been matched up against Biden repeatedly with regards to foreign policy, and he comes out double digits ahead in terms of whether people trust him on the issue. Uh, around the world under Donald Trump, he was much better at securing deals and generally keeping the calm intact with nations that are difficult to work with, so they're not part of the Western sphere. The diplomacy with our closer allies, therefore, was fixated on more by the legacy media because if the U.S. isn't willing to play good cop, bad cop and bomb people all around the world, France and other countries had to actually do it and look like they were the bad cop, and so they bitched and moaned about it. Mainly, it's the U.S. being the bad cop to generally the rest of the NATO sphere's good cop. No, 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 we call for restraint. The U.S. is bombing you. We're very sad. You did a naughty thing, but we call for diplomacy. Let's take it to the U.N. or something like that. It's a grift. Uh, they couldn't do that under Donald Trump. He wasn't willing to play that game. And so for years, 
you had reasonable rapprochement, a kind of thawing out of tension in the Middle East. You had the Abraham Accords. Certainly in Korea, that was Trump's shining moment. He was the first U.S. president to step foot in North Korea. Things generally went off without a hitch, and for a couple of years there, the North Koreans weren't firing rockets all the time because they didn't feel it was necessary. There was an attempt at rapprochement. It partially worked. It would have worked better if uh, we had kept up with it longer. Unfortunately, that's partially fallen apart now. The hope is a second term of Trump will yield similar results to the first term. Um, I mean, I mean, the success with Russia. Russia invades Crimea under Obama. It then does nothing under Donald Trump. It then invades the rest of Ukraine under the dude who served under Obama. Are we seeing a little bit of a pattern here? The problem for Joe Biden is that the normal strategy of starting a war deliberately, getting yourself dragged into conflict in order to use the incumbent advantage for an election gig, doesn't necessarily hold true because, I mean, we'd, we'd have a lack of precedent for the challenger also having been president of the United States. It's not like a bush Kerry deal or something like that. This is a person who's already been in that office. So there's a, a diplomatic track record in that same role. Will, therefore, and I can't tell you the answer, if this war is successfully enjoined by the United States, specifically by the warmongers at the Biden administration, if Blinken gets his way Millie style, so you have a president who will greenlight the strike instead of who will say you're nuts, like when Milley tried to get Trump to go into, into uh, Iran. I, I wonder why Trump didn't like the dude towards the end. <laughs> it's, it couldn't be that he knew something that the American public didn't know, like the fact that some of these people are batshit insane. If they're successful, it's even odds whether it actually helps Joe, though. You know, it'll knock out, like, the economy will be out of the news cycle. People talk less about the border, again, unless it's framed against the debate over... Should we bomb this village or should we leave this village alone and bomb that town or port over there or something? But will it have a negative impact on the challenger when the challenger's got quasi-incumbency by having been in the role? Again, this is going to flummox people within polling analysis probably if it ends up popping off. And of course, my hope is, because I'm not ghoulish, that things calm down in the Middle East that there is rapprochement, that things go back to being calm. Somehow or another, calm is restored, and we don't end up in a war. Because then you end up with nice, pretty little caskets draped in U.S. flags coming back over with grieving families, and then Biden go shake their hand and talk about how brave their kid was for literally getting dragged into a war that 99% of them don't want to fight him. Uh, I, I oppose that. I think, I think that it's ghoulish if you support the concept. But if it does happen, it's definitely going to make for some strange uh, political bedfellows. <laughs> it's going to be difficult to gauge what impact it'll actually have on the current political trajectory of the United States election. Uh, you may end up with a weird situation where the Republicans are the ones that are, that are more averse to the idea of continuing strikes or something, while berating Biden when things inevitably get snafued, which they will. I would challenge you to see any any venue of foreign policy that Biden or someone in his administration has gotten explicitly involved in that hasn't fallen to shit. I mean, the Abraham Accords are hazarded. Korea again is popping off. You've got uh, you've got Ukraine um, over and over again where U.S. foreign policy is involved in any way. Right now, under Crazy Joe, it, it falls apart. So. We'll see whether people's greater trust in Trump or the non-technical incumbency of Biden. It's uh, hard to decide which one would be more of a factor and which one would be more positive for the candidate, assuming that Biden gets his way. But I do think that he and his people realize that unless they throw up the Hail Mary of dragging us into a major regional conflict, that he's got effectively no chance. There'd be no plausible way that they could even have enough ballot printers going brr in order to fool people into thinking that he had viability. Again, I've been analyzing the polls this whole, whole time, and Joe Biden is behind, never was behind, by the way, in 2020, and won by a couple hundred thousand fucking votes, is behind a person who may very well end up running under house arrest. Uh, I, I think the American public sentiment has shifted considerably since a couple of years ago. And that Joe, you know, no more mean tweets. Come on, man, we're going to do jumping jacks behind the shed and really clobber our enemies. And, we're, you know, America first really means, you know, more welfare for the 
working class, more peanuts, uh, while, Joe, while Joe spends the rest of it on a bullshit infrastructure so-called, people have started to sour on it because it hasn't had a positive impact. So if we get into a major war, uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, anything could and probably will happen in such a situation. Also, yeah, you know, you are on the precipice of World War III if we get involved there, right? It's a little bit different from Afghanistan. Uh, there happen to be nukes in the region. There happen to be nations with substantial state-level militaries, the Egyptians, the Iranians, the Turks, the Syrians to an extent, certainly Israel itself. The whole area is a fucking powder keg, so we'll see if Joe Biden is crazy enough to light the match. Unfortunately, I already deduced that he wants to. That's about all. Peace out.